This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapters 39 and 40. Chapter 39 all the events of that night have a great importance, since they brought about a situation which remained unchanged till Jim's return. Jim had been away in the interior for more than a week, and it was Dain Waris who had directed the first repulse. That brave and intelligent youth, who uh, knew how to fight after the manner of white men, wished to settle the business off-hand, but his people were too much for him. He had not Jim's racial prestige and the reputation of invincible supernatural power. He was not the visible, tangible incarnation of unfailing truth and of unfailing victory. Beloved, trusted, and admired as he was, he was still one of them, while Jim was one of us. Moreover, the white man, a tower of strength in himself, was invulnerable, while Dain Waris could be killed. Those unexpressed thoughts guided the opinion of the chief men of the town, who elected to assemble in Jim's fort for deliberation upon the emergency, as if expecting to find wisdom and courage in the dwelling of the absent white man. The shooting of Brown's ruffians was so far good or lucky that there had been half a dozen casualties amongst the defenders. The wounded were lying on the veranda tended by their womenfolk, the women and children from the lower part of the town had been sent into the fort at the first alarm. There Jewel was in command, very efficient and high-spirited, obeyed by Jim's own people, who, quitting in a body their little settlement under the stockade, had gone in to form the garrison. The refugees crowded round her, and through the whole affair, to the very disastrous last, she showed an extraordinary martial ardour. It was to her that Dain Waris had gone at once at the first intelligence of danger, for you must know that Jim was the only one in Patizan who possessed a store of gunpowder. Stein, with whom he had kept up intimate relations by letters, had obtained from the Dutch government a special authorization to export five hundred kegs of it to Patizan. The powder magazine was a small hut of rough logs covered entirely with earth, and in Jim's absence the girl had the key. In the council, held at eleven o'clock in the evening in Jim's dining-room, she backed up Warisa's advice for immediate and vigorous action. I am told that she stood up by the side of Jim's empty chair at the head of the long table, and made a warlike, impassioned speech, which for the moment extorted murmurs of approbation from the assembled headmen. Old Doramin, who had not showed himself outside his own gate for more than a year, had been brought across with great difficulty. He was, of course, the chief man there. The temper of the council was very unforgiving, and the old man's word would have been decisive, but it is my opinion that, well aware of his son's fiery courage, he dared not pronounce the word. More dilatory counsels prevailed. A certain Haji Saman pointed out at great length that these tyrannical and ferocious men had delivered themselves to a certain death in any case. They would stand fast on their hill and starve, or they would try to regain their boat and be shot from ambushes across the creek, or they would break and fly into the forest and perish singly there. He argued that by the use of proper stratagems these evil-minded strangers could be destroyed without the risk of a battle, and his words had a great weight, especially with the Patizan men proper. What unsettled the minds of the townfolk was the failure of the Rajah's boats to act at the decisive moment. It was the diplomatic Kasim who represented the Rajah at the council. He spoke very little, listened smilingly, very friendly and impenetrable. During the sitting, messengers kept arriving every few minutes almost, with reports of the invaders' proceedings. Wild and exaggerated rumors were flying. 
There was a large ship at the mouth of the river with big guns and many more men, some white, others with black skins and of bloodthirsty appearance. They were coming with many more boats to exterminate every living thing. A sense of near, incomprehensible danger affected the common people. At one moment there was a panic in the courtyard amongst the women, shrieking, a rush, children crying, Huji Sunan went out to quiet them. Then a fort sentry fired at something moving on the river, and nearly killed a villager bringing in his womenfolk in a canoe, together with the best of his domestic utensils and a dozen fowl. This caused more confusion. Meantime the palaver inside Jim's house went on in the presence of the girl. Doramine sat fierce-faced, heavy, looking at the speakers in turn, and breathing slow like a bull. He didn't speak till the last, after Kasim had declared that the Rajah's boats would be called in, because the men were required to defend his master's stockade. Dain Waris, in his father's presence, would offer no opinion, though the girl entreated him in Jim's name to speak out. She offered him Jim's own men, in her anxiety to have these intruders driven out at once, he only shook his head, after a glance or two at Doramin. Finally, when the council broke up, it had been decided that the houses nearest the creek should be strongly occupied to obtain the command of the enemy's boat. The boat itself was not to be interfered with openly, so the robbers on the hill should be tempted to embark, when a well-directed fire would kill most of them, no doubt. To cut off the escape of those who might survive, and to prevent more of them coming up, Dain Maurice was ordered by Doramin to take an armed party of boogies down the river to a certain spot ten miles below Patizan, and there to form a camp on the shore and blockade the stream with the canoes. I don't believe for a moment that Doramin feared the arrival of fresh forces. My own opinion is that his conduct was guided solely by his wish to keep his son out of harm's way. To prevent a rush being made into the town, the construction of a stockade was to be commenced at daylight, at the end of the street on the left bank. The old Nakoda declared his intention to command there himself. A distribution of powder, bullets, and percussion caps was made immediately under the girl's supervision. Several messengers were to be dispatched in different directions after Jim, whose exact whereabouts were unknown. These men started at dawn, but before that time Kasim had managed to open communications with the besieged Brown. That accomplished diplomatist and confidant of the Rajah, on leaving the fort to go back to his master, took into his boat Cornelius, whom he found slinking mutely amongst the people in the courtyard. Kasim had a little plan of his own and wanted him for an interpreter. Thus it came about that towards morning, Brown, reflecting upon the desperate nature of his position, heard from the marshy overgrown hollow an amicable, quavering, strained voice crying, in English, for permission to come up, under a promise of personal safety and on a very important errand. He was overjoyed. If he was spoken to, he was no longer a hunted wild beast. These friendly sounds took off at once the awful stress of vigilant watchfulness, as of so many blind men not knowing whence the death-blow might come. He pretended a great reluctance. The voice declared itself, A white man, a poor, ruined old white man who has been living here for years. A mist, wet and chilly, lay on the slopes of the hill, and after some more shouting from one to the other, Brown called out, "'Come on, then, but alone, mind!' As a matter of fact, he told me, writhing with rage at the recollection of his helplessness, it made no difference. They couldn't see more than a few yards before them, and no treachery could make their position worse. By and by Cornelius, in his weekday attire of a ragged, dirty shirt and pants, barefooted, with a broken-rimmed pith-hat on his head, was made out vaguely, sidling up to the defences, hesitating, stopping to listen in a peering posture. 
Come along, you're safe, yelled Brown, while his men stared. All their hopes of life became suddenly centred in that dilapidated, mean newcomer, who in profound silence clambered clumsily over a felled tree trunk, and shivering with his sour, mistrustful face, looked about at the knot of bearded, anxious, sleepless desperadoes. Half an hour's confidential talk with Cornelius opened Brown's eyes as to the home affairs of Patizan. He was on the alert at once. There were possibilities, immense possibilities, but before he would talk over Cornelius's proposals he demanded that some food should be sent up, as a guarantee of good faith. Cornelius went off, creeping sluggishly down the hill on the side of the Rajah's palace, and after some delay a few of Tunku Alang's men came up, bringing a scanty supply of rice, chilies, and dried fish. This was immeasurably better than nothing. Later on Cornelius returned, accompanying Cassim, who stepped out with an air of perfect good-humoured trustfulness in sandals, and muffled up from neck to ankles in dark blue sheeting. He shook hands with Brown discreetly, and the three drew aside for a conference. Brown's men, recovering their confidence, were slapping each other on the back, and cast knowing glances at their captain while they busied themselves with the preparations for cooking. Cassim disliked Doramin and his boogies very much, but he hated the new order of things still more. It had occurred to him that these whites, together with the Rajah's followers, could attack and defeat the boogies before Jim's return. Then, he reasoned, general defection of the townsfolk was sure to follow, and the reign of the white men who protected poor people would be over. Afterwards the new allies could be dealt with. They would have no friends. The fellow was perfectly able to perceive the difference of character, and had seen enough of white men to know that these newcomers were outcasts, men without country. Brown preserved a stern and inscrutable demeanour. When he first heard Cornelius's voice demanding admittance, it brought merely the hope of a loophole for escape. In less than an hour other thoughts were seething in his head. Urged by an extreme necessity, he had come there to steal food, a few tons of rubber or gum, maybe, perhaps a handful of dollars, and had found himself enmeshed by deadly dangers. Now, in consequence of these overtures from Cassim, he began to think of stealing the whole country. Some confounded fellow had apparently accomplished something of the kind, single-handed at that. Couldn't have done it very well, though. Perhaps they could work together squeeze everything dry, and then go out quietly. In the course of his negotiations with Cassim, he became aware that he was supposed to have a big ship with plenty of men outside. Cassim begged him earnestly to have this big ship with his many guns and men brought up the river without delay for the Rajah's service. Brown professed himself willing, and on this basis the negotiation was carried on with mutual distrust. Three times in the course of the morning the courteous and active Cassim went down to consult the Rajah, and came up busily with his long stride. Brown, while bargaining, had a sort of grim enjoyment in thinking of his wretched schooner, with nothing but a heap of dirt in her hold, that stood for an armed ship, and a Chinaman and a lame ex-beachcomber of Levuka on board, who represented all his many men. In the afternoon he obtained further doles of food, a promise of some money, and a supply of mats for his men to make shelters for themselves. They lay down and snored, protected from the burning sunshine, but Brown, sitting fully exposed on one of the felled trees, feasted his eyes upon the view of the town and the river. There was much loot there. Cornelius, who had made himself at home in the camp, talked at his elbow pointing out the localities, imparting advice, giving his own version of Jim's character, and commenting in his own fashion upon the events of the last three years. Brown, who, apparently indifferent and gazing away, listened with attention to every word, could not make out clearly what sort of man this Jim could be. "'What's his name? Jim? Jim? That's not enough for a man's name.' 
they call him said cornelius scornfully tuan jim here as you may say lord jim what is he where does he come from inquired brown what sort of man is he is he an englishman yes yes he's an englishman i am an englishman too from malacca he is a fool all you have to do is kill him and then you are king here everything belongs to him explained cornelius it strikes me he might be made to share with somebody before very long commented brown half aloud no no the proper way is to kill him the first chance you get and then you can do what you like cornelius would insist earnestly i have lived for many years here and i am giving you a friend's advice in such converse and in gloating over the view of patizan which he had determined in his mind should become his prey brown whiled away most of the afternoon his men meantime resting on that day dain waris's fleet of canoes stole one by one under the shore farthest from the creek and went down to close the river against his retreat of this brown was not aware and cassim who came up the knoll an hour before sunset took good care not to enlighten him he wanted the white man's ship to come up the river and this news he feared would be discouraging he was very pressing with brown to send the order offering at the same time a trusty messenger who for greater secrecy as he explained would make his way by land to the mouth of the river and deliver the order on board after some reflection brown judged it expedient to tear a page out of his pocket-book on which he simply wrote we are getting on big job detain the man the stolid youth selected by cassim for that service performed it faithfully and was rewarded by being suddenly tipped head first into the schooner's empty hold by the ex beachcomber and the chinaman who thereupon hastened to put on the hatches what became of him afterward brown did not say chapter forty brown's object was to gain time by fooling with cassim's diplomacy for doing a real stroke of business he could not help thinking the white man was the person to work with he could not imagine such a chap who must be confoundedly clever after all to get hold of the natives like that refusing a help that would do away with the necessity for slow cautious risky cheating that imposed itself as the only possible line of conduct for a single-handed man he brown would offer him the power no man could hesitate everything was coming to a clear understanding of course they would share the idea of there being a fort all ready to his hand a real fort with artillery he knew this from cornelius excited him let him only once get in and he would impose modest conditions not too low though the man was no fool it seemed they would work like brothers till uh, till the time came for a quarrel and a shot that would settle all accounts with grim impatience of plunder he wished himself to be talking with the man now the land already seemed to be his to tear to pieces squeeze and throw away meantime cassim had to be fooled for the sake of food first and for a second string but the principal thing was to get something to eat from day to day besides he was not averse to begin fighting on that rajah's account and teach a lesson to those people who had received him with shots the lust of battle was upon him i am sorry that i can't give you this part of the story which of course i have mainly from brown in brown's own words there was in the broken violent speech of that man unveiling before me his thoughts with the very hand of death upon his throat an undisguised ruthlessness of purpose a strange vengeful attitude towards his own past and a blind belief in the righteousness of his will against all mankind something of that feeling which could induce the leader of a horde of wandering cutthroats to call himself proudly the scourge of god no doubt the natural senseless ferocity which is the basis of such a character was exasperated by failure ill luck and the recent privations as well as by the desperate position in which he found himself 
But what was most remarkable of all was this, that while he planned treacherous alliances, had already settled in his own mind the fate of the white man, and intrigued in an overbearing, off-hand manner with Cassim, one could perceive that what he had really desired, almost in spite of himself, was to play havoc with that jungle town which had defied him, to see it strewn over with corpses and enveloped in flames. Listening to his pitiless, panting voice, I could imagine how he must have looked at it from the hillock, peopling it with images of murder and rapine. The part nearest to the creek wore an abandoned aspect, though, as a matter of fact, every house concealed a few armed men on the alert. Suddenly, beyond the stretch of waste ground, interspersed with small patches of low, dense bush, excavations, heaps of rubbish, with trodden paths between, a man, solitary and looking very small, strolled out into the deserted opening of the street between the shut-up, dark, lifeless buildings at the end, perhaps one of the inhabitants who had fled the other bank of the river, coming back for some object of domestic use. Evidently he supposed himself quite safe at that distance from the hill at the other side of the creek. A light stockade, set up hastily, was just round the turn of the street, full of his friends. He moved leisurely. Brown saw him, and instantly called to his side the Yankee deserter, who acted as a sort of second-in-command. This lanky, loose-jointed fellow came forward, wooden-faced, trailing his rifle lazily. When he understood what was wanted from him, a homicidal and conceited smile uncovered his teeth, making two deep folds down his sallow, leathery cheeks. He prided himself on being a dead shot. He dropped on one knee, and taking aim from a steady rest through the unlopped branches of a felled tree, fired, and at once stood up to look. The man, far away, turned his head to the report, made another step forward, seemed to hesitate, and abruptly got down on his hands and knees. In the silence that fell upon the sharp crack of the rifle, the dead shot, keeping his eyes fixed upon the quarry, guessed that this there coon's health would never be a source of anxiety to his friends any more. The man's limbs were seen to move rapidly under his body in an endeavour to run on all fours, in that empty space arose a multitudinous shout of dismay and surprise. The man sank flat, face down, and moved no more. "'That showed them what we could do,' said Brown to me. "'Struck the fear a sudden death into them. That was what we wanted. They were two hundred to one, and this gave them something to think over for the night. Not one of them had an idea of such a long shot before.' That beggar belonging to the Rajah scooted downhill with his eyes hanging out of his head. As he was telling me this, he tried, with a shaking hand, to wipe the thin foam on his blue lips. Two hundred to one! Two hundred to one! Strike terror! Terror! Terror, I tell you! His own eyes were starting out of their sockets. He fell back, clawing the air with skinny fingers sat up again, bowed and hairy, glared at me sideways like some man-beast of folklore, with open mouth in his miserable and awful agony, before he got his speech back after that fit. There are sights one never forgets. Furthermore, to draw the enemy's fire and locate such parties as might have been hiding in the bushes along the creek, Brown ordered the Solomon Islander to go down to the boat and bring an oar, as you send a spaniel after a stick in the water. This failed, and the fellow came back without a single shot having been fired at him from anywhere. "'There's nobody,' opined some of the men. "'It is unnatural,' remarked the Yankee. Cassim had gone, by that time, very much impressed, pleased, too, and also uneasy." Pursuing his tortuous policy, he had dispatched a message to Dain Waris, warning him to look out for the white men's ship, which, he had had information, was about to come up the river. He minimized its strength and exhorted him to oppose its passage. This double-dealing answered his purpose, which was to keep the Bugis forces divided, and to weaken them by fighting. 
On the other hand, he had, in the course of that day, sent word to the assembled Bugis chiefs in town, assuring them that he was trying to induce the invaders to retire. His messages to the fort asked earnestly for powder for the Rajah's men. It was a long time since Tunku Alang had had ammunition for the score or so of old muskets rusting in their arm-racks in the audience hall. The open intercourse between the hill and the palace unsettled all minds. It was already time for men to take sides, it began to be said. There would soon be much bloodshed, and thereafter great trouble for many people. The social fabric of orderly, peaceful life, when every man was sure of tomorrow, the edifice raised by Jim's hands, seemed on that evening ready to collapse into a ruin reeking with blood. The poorer folk were already taking to the bush or flying up the river. A good many of the upper class judged it necessary to go and pay their court to the Rajah. The Rajah's youths jostled them rudely. Old Tunku Alang, almost out of his mind with fear and indecision, either kept a sullen silence or abused them violently for daring to come with empty hands. They departed very much frightened. Only old Doramin kept his countrymen together, and pursued his tactics inflexibly. Enthroned in a big chair behind the improvised stockade, he issued his orders in a deep-veiled rumble, unmoved, like a deaf man in the flying rumors. Dusk fell, hiding first the body of the dead man which had been left lying with arms outstretched as if nailed to the ground, and then the revolving sphere of the night rolled smoothly over Patizan, and came to a rest, showering the glitter of countless worlds upon the earth. Again in the exposed part of the town, big fires blazed along the only street, revealing from distance to distance upon their glares the falling straight lines of roofs, the fragments of wattled walls jumbled in confusion, here and there a whole hut, elevated in the glow upon the vertical black stripes of a group of high piles, and all this line of dwellings, revealed in patches by the swaying flames, seemed to flicker tortuously away up river into the gloom at the heart of the land, a great silence in which the looms of successive fires played without noise, extended into the darkness at the foot of the hill, but the other bank of the river, all dark save for a solitary bonfire at the river front before the fort, sent out into the air an increasing tremor that might have been the stamping of a multitude of feet, the hum of many voices, or the fall of an immensely distant waterfall. It was then, Brown confessed to me, while turning his back on his men he sat looking at it all, that notwithstanding his disdain, his ruthless faith in himself, a feeling came over him that at last he had run his head against a stone wall. Had his boat been afloat at the time, he believed he would have tried to steal away, taking his chances of a long chase down the river and of starvation at sea. It is very doubtful whether he would have succeeded in getting away. However, he didn't try this. For another moment he had a passing thought of trying to rush the town, but he perceived very well that in the end he would find himself in the lighted street, where they would be shot down like dogs from the houses. They were two hundred to one, he thought, while his men, huddling round two heaps of smouldering embers, munched the last of the bananas and roasted the few yams they owed to Cassim's diplomacy. Cornelius sat amongst them, dozing sulkily. Then one of the whites remembered that some tobacco had been left in the boat, and, encouraged by the impunity of the Solomon Islander, said he would go to fetch it. At this all the others shook off their despondency. Brown, applied to, said, "'Go and be damned to you!' scornfully. He didn't think there was any danger in going to the creek in the dark. The man threw a leg over the tree-trunk and disappeared. A moment later he was heard clambering into the boat, and then clambering out. "'I've got it!' he cried. A flash and a report at the very foot of the hill followed. "'I'm hit!' yelled the man. "'Look out! Look out! I'm hit!' And instantly all the rifles went off. The hill squirted fire and noise into the night like a little volcano, and when Brown and the Yankee, with curses and cuffs, stopped the panic-stricken firing, 
a profound and weary groan floated up from the creek, succeeded by a plaint whose heart-rending sadness was like some poison turning the blood cold in the veins. Then a strong voice pronounced several distinct, incomprehensible words somewhere beyond the creek. "'Let no one fire!' shouted Brown. "'What does it mean?' "'Do you hear on the hill? Do you hear? Do you hear?' repeated the voice three times. Cornelius translated, then prompted the answer. "'Speak!' cried Brown. "'We hear!' Then the voice, declaiming in the sonorous, inflated tone of a herald, and shifting continually on the edge of the vague wasteland, proclaim that between the men of the Bugis nation living in Patizan and the white man on the hill and those with them, there would be no faith, no compassion, no speech, no peace. A bush rustled, a haphazard volley rang out. "'Damn foolishness!' muttered the Yankee, vexedly grounding the butt. Cornelius translated, the wounded man below the hill, after crying out twice, "'Take me up! Take me up!' went on complaining in moans. While he had kept on the blackened earth of the slope, and afterwards crouching in the boat, he had been safe enough. It seems that in his joy at finding the tobacco he forgot himself and jumped out of her offside, as it were. The white boat, lying high and dry, showed him up. The creek was no more than seven yards wide in that place, and there happened to be a man crouching in the bush on the other bank. He was a Bugis of Tondanao, only lately come to Patizan, and a relation of the man shot in the afternoon. That famous long shot had indeed appalled the beholders. The man, in utter security, had been struck down, in full view of his friends, dropping with a joke on his lips, and they seemed to see in the act an atrocity which had stirred a bitter rage. That relation of his, Si La Pa by name, was then with Doramine in the stockade only a few feet away. You who know these chaps must admit that the fellow showed an unusual pluck by volunteering to carry the message alone in the dark. Creeping across the open ground, he had deviated to the left and found himself opposite the boat. He was startled when Brown's man shouted. He came to a sitting position with his gun to his shoulder, and when the other jumped out, exposing himself, he pulled the trigger, and lodged three jagged slugs point-blank into the poor wretch's stomach. Then, lying flat on his face, he gave himself up for dead, while a thin hail of lead chopped and swished the bushes close on his right hand. Afterwards he delivered his speech, shouting, bent double, dodging all the time in cover. With the last word he leaped sideways, lay close for a while, and afterwards got back to the houses unharmed, having achieved on that night such a renown as his children will not willingly allow to die. And on the hill the forlorn band let the two little heaps of embers go out under their bowed heads. They sat dejected on the ground, with compressed lips and downcast eyes, listening to their comrade below. He was a strong man, and died hard with moans now loud, now sinking to a strange, confidential note of pain. Sometimes he shrieked, and again, after a period of silence, he could be heard muttering deliriously a long and unintelligible complaint. Never for a moment did he cease. "'What's the good?' Brown had said, unmoved once, seeing the Yankee, who had been swearing under his breath, prepare to go down. "'That's so,' assented the deserter, reluctantly desisting. "'There's no encouragement for wounded men here. "'Only his noise is calculated to make all the others think too much of the hereafter, Captain. "'Water!' cried the wounded man in an extraordinarily clear, vigorous voice, "'and then went off moaning feebly. "'Aye, water. Water will do it,' muttered the other to himself resignedly. "'Plenty by and by.' the tide is flowing. At last the tide flowed, silencing the plaint and cries of pain, and the dawn was near when Brown, sitting with his chin in the palm of his hand before Patizan, as one might stare at the unscalable side of a mountain, heard the brief ringing bark of a brass six-pounder far away in town somewhere. "'What's this?' he asked of Cornelius, who hung about him. Cornelius listened, a muffled roaring shout rolled down river over the town, 
a big drum began to throb and others responded pulsating and droning tiny scattered lights began to twinkle in the half dark of the town while the part lighted by the loom of fires hummed with a deep and prolonged murmur he has come said cornelius what already are you sure brown asked yes yes sure listen to the noise what are they making that row about pursued brown for joy snorted cornelius he is a very great man but all the same he knows no more than a child and so they make a great noise to please him because they know no better look here said brown how is one to get at him he shall come to talk to you cornelius declared what do you mean come down here strolling as it were cornelius nodded vigorously in the dark yes he will come straight here to talk to you he is just like a fool you shall see what a fool he is brown was incredulous you shall see you shall see repeated cornelius he is not afraid not afraid of anything he will come and order you to leave his people alone everybody must leave his people alone he is like a little child he will come to you straight alas he knew jim well that mean little skunk as brown called him to me yes certainly he pursued with ardor and then captain you tell that tall man with a gun to shoot him you just kill him and you will frighten everybody so much that you can do anything you like with them afterward get what you like go away when you like ha 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 fine he almost danced with impatience and eagerness and brown looking over his shoulder at him could see shown up by the pitiless dawn his men drenched with dew sitting amongst the cold ashes in the litter of the camp haggard cowed and in rags end of chapters thirty nine and forty